السلام عليك زين الأنبياء السلام على الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله عدد ما في علم الله صلاة والسلام دائما ودوام منك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وشر أنه الله الذي لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله واحدا ورب شاهدا ونحن له مسلمون وأشهد أن سيدنا وسيدنا وكرة عيوننا محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهر على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون أما بعد الحمد لله from the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the day of Juma was gifted to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his ummah and this is one of the khususiyat and the special properties of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his ummah and indeed this is a day that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala has given his bounty and been a means, made a means to or the bestow of his divine bounty subhanahu wa ta'ala of all of the salawat and mafruda, all of all of the obligatory prayers is that Jum'ah it has the most merit. Of all prayers that are prayed in congregation is that this is the very best congregation of all, the congregation of Jum'ah and that according to some that it is the greatest day as is testified to by the words of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The very best day that the sun has shone upon is the day of Jum'ah And so if we look at this name uh, that has been given to this blessed day is that it takes its name from the gathering that takes place in it because a Jama'ah is a congregation and so Jum'ah is the day of gathering and one of the names of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Jami'ah. He is the gatherer, he is the uniter subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is in this blessed day that the believers come together in order to be able to receive the divine bounty. The spiritual realities of this day are great and the ulama that came before us spoke about them. The likes of Imam al-Sha'rani who said that the tajalli of our Lord is so great on the day of Jum'ah that it has been legislated that we do it in congregation because the individual will not be able to bear it. And so again, like so many things, that there's an outward that mold to the things that we do and then there's an inner reality. And so that we don't just come together for the sake of coming together. We come together because that we are avidly seeking, ideally, the divine bounty of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala in this type of tama, this type of greedy desire that is greedy desire for the bounty and grace of our Lord is something that is desirable and it is something that is the way that the true people of Allah are. And so that if we take this time to look at a few meanings of one of the chapters of the Quran that is titled al Juma and that the name of this chapter takes its name from that the mentioning of Jum'ah in verse 9 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believers that when the prayer, the call to prayer is called on the day of Jum'ah hasten to the remembrance of Allah the surah takes its name because of the mentioning of Jum'ah in it. And one of the, the important things, if we look at the other verses that come before this, because there is a total of 11 verses, and incidentally this is a Medinan chapter of the Qur'an, and which means that it was revealed after the Hijrah. And that we see is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about and archetypal community that came before us in one of the problems that related to their religious practice is that they were given the book and they were supposed to bear it and they were supposed to live by its meanings but they that refused to do so is that they that were given outward knowledge but they had lost the spirit and as is the case with all of the stories of all of the different peoples that came before us in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
They are primarily there for you and I to take heed and to learn lessons from them, as opposed to simply lambast those who came before us. It is there for a clarification, and it is there in order to teach us a lesson so that we do not fall into the same problem that people before us fell. And that what is this reality is that it really gets back to one of the two ways that someone goes astray in relation to the deen is that someone could go astray through knowledge and not being able to put that knowledge and not putting that knowledge into practice or someone could go astray from a lack of knowledge these are the two basic archetypes غير المغضوب عليهم والضالين the first of those who have incurred God's wrath and it's a worse state to be in because someone knows but they don't put their knowledge into practice and then the second which is still not a good state is someone to go astray from the lack of knowledge. But in relation to that these two archetypal ways of going astray is that we need to maintain the balance in the middle. And the balance in the middle is between that sloth, lassitude, that just sheer laziness where you know there's something that you need to do however that you don't that muster up the courage and place the effort into that thing in order to do it. And the other extreme on the other side is that where you have so much excessive zeal that it leads to extremist tendencies where that you get yourself even in more trouble. As our Prophet warned us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam halakan mutanatti'oon, halakan mutanatti'oon, halakan mutanatti'oon repeating it three times is that the extremists will be destroyed the extremist will be destroyed, the extremist will be destroyed, then that has a number of manifestations. That relates to belief, that relates to practice, just as it relates to the way that we approach that our spiritual states and the balance between that doing what it is that we need to do in this world and preparation for the next world. What we want ultimately though is balance. On one side of the spectrum we don't want to be lazy, but on the other side of the spectrum that we don't want to have so much zeal that we burn out and we tire ourselves out. That we want to be able to find that balance right in the middle. But really what this surah is treating is that it's treating this problem of a people that they might have everything that they need outwardly, but they've lost the spirit. They've lost that motivating factor within them that enables them to do that anything that it is that they should be doing. And that this, if you look at the blessing of Islam, in that people that are well read and educated and know very well the state of Muslims in that the various countries that they come from in the Muslim world, is that we all know that there's a lot of problems. We all know that if we look at the reality of our community right now in a place like the United States of America, and if you want to give a baseball metaphor, is that the vast majority of our community that we're really in the little leagues and that many of the issues that we're dealing with is like that major league baseball. And if you take someone who's in the little leagues and put them that to the plate with a 95 mile an hour fastball, is that it's going to be that a little bit difficult for him to get on base. He's going to feel a little bit intimidated. This is the reality. And there's a number of reasons and factors behind that and that in many ways we're not living up to that our own deen and what it calls us to. But this is not cause for despair. This is exactly why we have to work. And that there are many of the reasons why we're in the situation that we're in are understandable because that we are a new community and we are a growing community. And that given that the increased that interactions of the world is that when you have people that come to this country from places that are very different than the United States of America, you can't expect them all of a sudden overnight to be able to adapt and to be able to understand exactly what it is that we need to be doing here because of the stark differences. Say, I'm saying all of that to say is that despite that and despite much of the dysfunctionality that you find in the Muslim world, which we should speak out against and which we should do our best to that correct, despite all of that, is that there is something preserved in the deen of Sayyidina Muhammad bin Abdullah that is not preserved in any other religion. The spirit of the religion, this aspect of having that your religion be alive in your heart and having an unbroken chain back to the Prophet and having numerous inheritors of our Prophet still here with us, 
on the face of this earth that can be a source of guidance for us who they in and of themselves are living the realities of this deen this is one of the greatest blessings of all and that were you to compare that blessing to every other thing that was just mentioned I mentioned it very generally and can go into great detail is that this is the single most important thing of all that you would trade everything else that was mentioned for this and we have to remember that is that this is still preserved in our deen yes there is a danger of it waning but this is exactly why we need to read the Quran that we need to do what it is that we need to do to be able to that have this spirit not only remain but also strengthen so that if we looked at the way that this chapter in the Quran begins it begins with the words of Allah Ta'ala يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ is that all that is in the heavens and the earth glorifies God Al-Malik Al-Qudus Al-Aziz Al-Hakim and that these four descriptions of our Lord these four great names of His Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala the King, the Holy, the Mighty, the Wise this is how it begins everything in the heavens and the earth is making tasbih and this could be in reality or this could be with their lisan al hal meaning that everything is pointing to the oneness of Allah and by extension that His beautiful names to Baraka wa Ta'ala but then we have a mentioning of our Prophet He is the one who sent amongst the unlettered a messenger minhum that he is from them yatlu alayhim ayatihi he recites to them that his signs or his verses and he purifies them and he teaches them the book and the wisdom there are four or you could say three fundamental duties of the Prophet that are mentioned here and that when you combine them all together that you understand what was the primary purpose of the Rasul وسلم, why he was on the face of this earth the first is that he recites the book of Allah that to them in the verses of our Lord and one of the meanings that you can extract from that is that the oral transmission of this deen comes first it is primarily an oral transmission from heart to heart from tongue to tongue it is an oral transmission in other words is that this is not a deen that is preserved that merely in books it takes interactions outwardly in order for to have the internal realities inculcated within ourselves but then what is the necessary result of being in the presence of our Prophet or by extension one of his inheritors who are reciting that his signs and his verses will you him you are going to be purified and all of the dimensions of purification at the level of belief at the level of practice and at the level of the heart and then that there is an ongoing process of learning there's an ongoing process of learning of the book of Allah in the wisdom which is the sunnah of our Prophet وسلم, his words, his acts and the moments of silence and his tacit approvals and even his traits وسلم, all of these are constantly teaching us from the cradle to the grave if we open up our ears and our eyes and our hearts to learn and so this is an ongoing process then from the day to the day that we believe until the day that we meet our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah reminds us eventually that this is from his fadl but then he shifts into the, a discussion of the Jewish people and again is that the purpose of the story is that we remind ourselves of some of the tendencies of the people who came before us and he says that the likeness of those who were entrusted with the Torah then fail to uphold it is the likeness of a donkey who carries books and when does Allah Ta'ala then say that bitsa mathal al-qawm al-ladhina kaddhu bi ayatillah wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al-zhalimeen is that he says evil is the likeness of the people who deny God's signs and God does not guide the evil doing folk in other words is that if we have knowledge outwardly but we fail to put it into practice 
is that we have the outward dimension of religion, but it is not touching our hearts. The reality is that there is no difference between us and between the creatures that are walking on the face of this earth. This is what differentiates true religion from false religion, is that putting your knowledge into practice, is it living the realities of the Dean. This is the difference between the two. This is an essence of what this whole affair is about, is that as we expose ourselves to knowledge and to learning, is that it actually that gets into our heart and lodges itself therein and affects us positively and motivates us to do what is right and to do good. And then Allah Ta'ala Ta that then that challenges that anyone, and this is a specific people, but by extension all people, that قُلْ يَا يُوَ لَذِينَ حَادُوا إِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ لِلَّهِ That, oh, that, oh, you who believe, oh, you people from, that are of, of, of from, uh, that, uh, of the Jewish religion, is that if you are claiming that you are the awliya of Allah, if you are claiming that you are the awliya of Allah to the exclusion of other people, فَتَمَنَّوَ الْمَوْتِ Then long for death. فَتَمَنَّوَ الْمَوْتَ إِن كُنْتُمْ فَتَمَنَّوَ الْمَوْتَ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ That if indeed that you are truthful. وَلَا يَتَمَنَّوْنُهُ أَبَدًا بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ عَيْدِهِمُ اللَّهُ عَلِمُ الظَّالِمِينَ But they will never that long for it ever. From what their hands have put forth and Allah Ta'ala knows well the wrongdoers. What is Allah teaching us here? Is that there's something about death in and of itself which is the separator between us and this world that is really the true test to see are we truly living the teachings that it is that we have or not. It relates to this, that if we are longing for death because that if we are claiming to be awliya of Allah, we are claiming to be beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that if you love someone that you want to meet with him, and so that if you claim that you are awliya of Allah, that means that you want to meet your Lord necessarily because the only way to truly meet and to truly know and to truly be in the presence of our Lord is that when we transfer from this world into the next world, even though Allah Ta'ala from His bounty that brings forth some of the paradisical realities of the bliss of the next world to the righteous here in this world. However, is that the meeting with Allah Ta'ala is really what it, what the righteous person longs for. And so that this is the test that we can put ourselves through, that if we are claiming to be religious people, if we are really claiming to put our knowledge into practice and that we are really living the realities of this deen, is that where are you and I in relation to death? And that if you think about the righteous people of our time, and you think about the righteous people who came before us, is that this was a constant in them. Is that they were people that spent time while they were living, preparing for death. These are people that are ready. These are people that were you to tell them that they were going to die tomorrow, is that they're not, they wouldn't flinch and they would be ready to meet their Lord. That I was with one of these people one time, and usually when an unexpected thing happens, this is when you can really tell whether something is firmly rooted in something or not. And that we were driving and the driver had to slam on his brakes. And it seemed at first as if we were going to hit the car in front of us. And this individual was looking towards the back, talking to the people in the back of the car. And then when the driver slammed on his brakes, he just said without even thinking, Bismillah as if he was just ready. Bismillah. And it was something that you could feel that when someone says something with a hal, with a state, that this person was not only ready but looking forward to the meeting with his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that this is what we hope to inculcate ourselves in, from, in ourselves from that practicing regularly. And then Allah tabarak wa ta'ala that he goes on to say that say that indeed that death that you are fleeing from, indeed, it is going to meet you and then you will be returned to the knower of the seen and the unseen and he will inform you about that which you used to do. 
Now it's towards the end of the chapter here that Allah Tabaraka Ta'ala will mention Juma. And he says, O oh, you who believe that when the call for prayer is made on Friday, hasten to the remembrance of Allah and leave aside all commerce. Sa'a yas'a is literally to walk fast. Now here it doesn't mean that in this verse because that we know that when we come to prayer we're supposed to walk with sakina and waqar, with tranquility and dignity. But here it means is that hasten, metaphorically speaking, in your heart to the remembrance of Allah and to leave outwardly commerce or by extension any other thing that would preoccupy you for the day of Juma. In other words, what are we really being called to? We're being called to respond to the call of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, which is the Adhan. And that we know that the Adhan begins with Allahu Akbar. And so that when the call to prayer is called, and by extension, every other thing that we are called to, the sign that our heart is alive is the degree to which that we respond that to that call. Is the degree to which that we feel motivated to do what it is that we are being called to do. And then you might have people whose nafs and soul is trying to get in the way. And this is where we have to put in struggle to be able to do what it is that we know that we need to do. And then there are people whose souls have become pure. Is that they are motivated by the call, rather they are waiting for the call before the call is even called. Is that they are waiting for the moment to respond to Allah wa Ta'ala in all of the minor manifestations of this in our lives that happen in very subtle ways throughout the days of our lives are opportunities for us to be able to prepare ourselves for the real call which is when we're called back to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's that not wise for us to think is that oh that this one call this one way that I'm being called in a very minor way throughout my day is not important because when you add all of that up, what happens is, is it creates a hardness in the heart and it, there's preventatives that are then that put in place for us ultimately to meet our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this, the essence of this chapter is, is there for us to teach us the etiquette of responding to the call of Allah. فَسْعَوِلَ ذِكْرِ that hasten to the remembrance of Allah, hasten in turning to our Lord Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, and that this in and of itself, along with that what it leads to, which is a preparation for death, is the essence of this deen. This is something that Sidi Abdul Hakim Marad said, is that the other worldly impulse of religion is the essence of religion. This is what it's all about. And as he so that wisely notes, that in the Ihya al of Imam al-Ghazali, book 40 is the Kitab Dhikr al-Mawt wal-Akhira. It is the book on the remembrance of death and the afterlife. And he says, do not think that this is an appendix, as some do. He says, no, this is the culmination of the Ihya al -Madin. This is the culmination that in a number of ways, but in one way, in terms of you preparing by implementing the first 39 books of the Ihya, this is what it ultimately leads to, is you preparing to meet your Lord. وَمَنْ أَحَبَّ اللِّقَاءَ اللَّهُ وَحَبَّ اللَّهُ لِقَاءَهُ Is that if Allah, someone loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet them. May Allah wa ta'ala make this other world impulse dominant in ourselves and give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs. وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ أَقُولُ قُولِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمُ لِجِمِيَ مُسْلِمِينَ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, Ashraf al-Anbiya, Ibn Mursaleen, wa ala alihi al-Tayyibin, al-Tahirin, wa sahabati al-Akramin, wa tabi'in lahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-Din, wa alayna ma'ahum wa fihim bi rahmatika, ya arham al-Rahimin. Wa shadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahduhu la sharika lah, wa shadu anna Sayyidina Muhammadin, abduhu rasooluh, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, miftahi ba bi rahmatillah, عدد ما في علم الله صراة والسلام دائمين بدعمك الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد يا عباد الله أني موسيكم ونفس إياي بتقوى الله So this time that we're in in these first 10 days of the Hijjah 
the Eid is right around the corner, corner. Sunday is Arafah, and then Monday will be Eid. It is highly recommended that we all fast on the blessed day of Arafah if we're able to do so. And it is from the blessing of our Prophet Sallallahu that is an atonement for that this year's worth of sins and one year of worth of sins in the future. And the scholars point out is that the fasting on the day of Muharram is an atonement for the past years of sins. And the difference between the two is that Arafah is the day of Sayyidina Muhammad. And it is the day of the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad. And that just as is the case in all of our other acts is that they're multiplied likewise is that the reward for fasting on just this one day has this great reward from the bounty of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. These days are an opportunity for us to put into practice these meanings of Surah to Juma. Just as that every prayer is, just as every Juma is, every opportunity in the night and the day to implement the Sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu is an opportunity to respond to the call of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and to the extent that we do, even if it requires a bit of struggle in the beginning, is that it will then become easier and easier and it will become a habit firmly rooted in us so that then that we find our hearts coming to life with the meanings of the remembrance of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala which will then lead to a feeling of closeness because the reality is there is no physical closeness to Allah. Qurb, when we talk about proximity to Allah, it is a closeness of the heart. It relates to the lifting of the veil in particular. It relates to finding intimacy in the meanings of the remembrance of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no better way to prepare to meet our Lord than to get used to His remembrance is that once you get used and find intimacy in his remembrance and feel that feeling of proximity as a result, then you can only imagine what it would be like that after you get out of the abode of taklif and legal responsibility, where then all that remains is you and your beloved. This is really what it's all about. This is the whole purpose of Juma. It has been legislated to be able to that instill within ourselves Many of these great teachings that our Prophet brought us وسلم, and likewise these special times of the year is that Allah wa ta'ala has dispersed them amongst the year to give us opportunity after opportunity to expose ourselves to the sweet breezes of His mercy so that we can benefit as the principle states is that we were created to benefit. We were created to benefit and to literally profit that Allah Ta'ala did not create us to benefit from us. خُلِقْنَا لِنَرْبَحَ عَلَيْهِ لَا لِلَّهِ لِلَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَيْهِ يَرْبَحَ عَلَيْنَا As it is said in Arabic, Allah Ta'ala doesn't benefit from us. That He has given us everything in order so that we can accrue and obtain benefit. This is the essence of the teachings of our Prophet just as it is the essence. If you want to summarize Sharia, it is all about جَلْبَ الْمَصَادِحِ It is all about obtaining benefit and warding off harm and that there's no better way to do so than following the sunnah of our Prophet who there was no good except that he informed us of it and there was no evil except that he warned us of it. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq in these blessed days to be able to do that what is pleasing to him in these days in which acts righteous deeds that there's no time that is more beloved to him subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to perform them in the Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuha alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli wa sallam ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina muhammad kama sallayta ala sayyidina ibrahim wa ala ali sayyidina ibrahim wa barak ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina muhammad kama barakta ala sayyidina ibrahim wa ala ali sayyidina ibrahim fa alamin innaka hamidun majid wa radiyallahu ta'ala an sadatan khulafa rashidina abi bakr wa uthman wa ali wa jami'a سادة الصحابة الكرام أهل بيت الرسول الله المطهرين من الأرجاس وعلينا معهم فيهم برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات يا أول الأولين يا آخر الآخرين يا ذا القوة المتين ويا رحم الساكين ويا رحم الرحمين أنجزنا رحمة من عندك نسعد بها في الدنيا والآخرة We ask our Lord to barak wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq in our nights and our days and may Allah to add a place immense barakah in our own selves and in our families and in our children and the ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam May they be special days for us and may they be days of relief and of days that all of our needs are taken care of and likewise the needs of the ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepare us for the beating of him and may the otherworldly impulse of religion be dominant in our hearts Ya 
Rabbil Alameen. May we people who choose the afterlife over this world, Ya Rahman Rahimeen. And we ask you, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman Rahimeen, to forgive us of all of our sins and any impediments or obstacles or barriers that are between us. And setting on a path of drawing near to you, we ask you to completely move them, remove them, fi khayran wa lutsan wa afiyah. And maybe the very last thing we say when we exit this dunya, be la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, completely actualizing its meanings inwardly and outwardly. Awakamullah, Nasrakamullah, in the Allah, Ya Amr bin Adil wa Ihsani wa Ita'i the Qurba, wa Yanha and the Fahsha, Iwal Munki, Iwal Bari, Ya Idukum, the Alukum to the Koron, Ud Koron, Rodim Yat Kurkum, Washkur Alan Yami Zidkum, Walla the Koron Yakbar.